Okay, so we are starting. So last time we started talking about uh, you know, the role of algorithms in computing, uh, the importance of algorithms and why you need to study algorithm analysis and design. And uh, <coughs> so the example that we talked about last time was uh, merge sort versus insertion sort where one has an n log n running time and the other has an n squared running time okay and uh, with some calculations we uh, uh, we concluded that the difference is huge and the difference gets bigger as what Hmm? Approach yeah, exactly. As the the, the input size, uh, as the input size gets bigger, so with larger input sizes, you will see a bigger difference between an efficient algorithm and an inefficient algorithm. So the the asymptotic complexity that we use in analyzing algorithms, it it tells you the you know, when we talk about n or n squared or now in this case n is what? The n axis is the input size. This is the input size. And what's the what's the y axis? Time. Time. Hmm? Time. Well, it's not time. It's not really time. What is it precisely? In algorithm analysis, when we say complexity, and well, flex complexity it's, it's not what's the quantity that we are looking at? So when we say that this is n squared. Cycles? cycles? No, it's not cycles. S steps taken for you? What's that? Steps. Steps, yeah, steps or operations, yeah, exactly. Operations or steps. So remember, in, in algorithm analysis, we count the number of steps or operations as a function of input size. Now, how does the number of steps or operations relate to the actual execution time so the relation is not uh, is not straightforward so operations when we do algorithm analysis and when we count operations we count operations like uh, compare we count it as one operation uh, add we count it as an operation subtract we count it as an operation uh, store in memory store or assign we count it as an operation any one of these counts as one operation but do you think that this is accurate no, no. it's not accurate why not it's in the instruction set because yeah please go ahead instructions uh, depending on your architecture of your hardware yeah so these operations will not necessarily take the same time, right? Different operations take different, uh, uh, di di different time or different number of cycles on the processor. <coughs> so for example, an add will typically take one cycle and the subtract will take one cycle. Uh, but storing or assigning, you know, when you store to memory or when you load from memory, loading you know like you are reading the some entry in an array that's loading you are loading from memory so when you read from memory this can be very expensive how expensive how expensive can it get milliseconds how many four cycles no that's too optimistic <laughs> That's even more optimistic. So if 4 is optimistic, then 2 to 3 is more optimistic. 
it's uh, you know loading something from memory that depends on what uh, the time to load something in memory so you have an array and you are saying x equals a of i <coughs> a of i is getting loaded from memory now the time to execute this will depend on what the okay, where is it stored? Like what? What are the possibilities? In memory or storage? System memory. Okay, so if it's not in main memory, then we would like it. Would we like it to be in main memory or somewhere else? Yeah, We would like it to be in the cache. Right. So if uh, you know, if this is your CPU. You'll have uh, uh, <coughs> this is the if this is your processor, then you have the L1 cache on chip, and you have main mm -hmm. memory, and you have your uh, the CPU. Okay. So the L1 cache, which is on chi chip, can be accessed fairly quickly, but main memory may take a long time to access. So loading something from L1 cache into the CPU or CPU registers, let's look at registers, the CPU, CPU registers. Loading this to CPU registers can be done in two or three cycles or four, si two to three cycles. While loading something from main memory can take depends on your hertz. Okay, it dep definitely it depends on the processor and on m memory on your memory system. But what what is the typical number of cycles on a modern processor? Mm -hmm. Hundreds of cycles. Hundreds of cycles. So. What does it mean? It means that you know operations, different operations take different amounts of time uh, depending on what kind of operation, what kind of hardware. In asymptotic complexity, in our asymptotic complexity using the big O notation, we are not accounting for any of this. We are assuming that all operations take the same amount of time, which is, a, which is an approximation. It's a big approximation because an add, adding a value that is in CPU registers can be done in one cycle while loading can take hundreds of uh, cycles. So this is one source of approximation in the, in the big O uh, notation. So let's write here the uh, limitations. limitations of uh, asymptotic notation. And the first limitation we assume all processes, uh, sorry, all uh, operations take, we assume that all operations, that all operations take the same amount of time, which is an approximation. And we don't model memory and caching. And what's the other source of approximation in the big O notation? Worst there is, yeah. Worst case scenario. Uh, not not necessarily because in big O you can do worst case or best case or average case. Uh, usually we focus on worst case. Yes, you are right. But this is not an approximation. There is an obvious approximation in the big O. In the asymptotic notation. 
Yeah, so we ignore constants and what else? What else do we ignore? Lower. Yeah, lower order terms. So when you have something like if the running time, you know, t of n equals um, 4n squared plus 6n plus 10, then you count this as what? n squared. So just say t of n equals o of n squared. So in doing this, you have ignored, you have ignored the, the constants. So this is a, you have ignored this constant, you have ignored this constant, and you have ignored this whole lower order term. So we ignore constants and lower order terms. Okay, so that's why the uh, you know the asymptotic notation uh, you know does not give us an a precise a way of precisely estimating the actual execution time. To know the actual execution time, you will have to implement the algorithm and uh, run it. And then you will know the, uh, the exact execution time. So the asymptotic notation is an approximation, but it gives you a, a very good idea about an algorithm. And it, it allows you to compare different algorithms. Now, what's the rationale behind deleting lower order terms? Yeah, exactly. Because they are too small compared to the higher order terms <coughs> and the difference between lower order terms and higher order terms becomes bigger when, when n increases yeah exactly as n increases the difference between lower order terms and higher order terms becomes bigger so the 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 lower order terms will start to look smaller compared to the higher order terms as n increases now the question is, why do we care about larger values of n, not smaller values of n? In algorithm analysis, we always focus on larger values of n, larger values of input size. Why is that? Yes? Is it because normally when you're trying to have a more optimal algorithm, it's because you have a large set of data that you're trying to run through, but if you have a small set of data, Optimizing it won't do much since you won't save much time at all. Well, if you have a small amount of data, yes, optimizing it won't do you much, but th you will not have a problem, right? When the input size is too small, it, it doesn't matter which algorithm you use. You know, the difference between the, differ the different algorithms, the, the differences in efficiency will, uh, will be more pronounced when the input is bigger. For smaller inputs, uh, you will that w you know it will not make a difference. You know what algorithm you use. So let's uh, let's try to have an uh, so so we know now these limitations of the asymptotic notation. So let's now try to have a, a feel of you know what is big and what is small in an algorithm analysis. So if, uh, if we have, uh, if we have a one gigahertz processor, uh, this processor will do um, 10 power 9 cycles per yes. second. So a 1 gigahertz processor will do 10 power 9 cycles per yes. second. Now how many operations that is, that, that corresponds to? 
It depends on which kinds of operations. But in our algorithm analysis, we count, you know, we treat all operations equally, and we do not distinguish. So we just count operations. So if we assume that on average, an operation takes 10 cycles, if we assume that on average an operation takes 10 cycles, is this, does this tend to be optimistic or pessimistic, 10 cycles on average? Optimistic. Yeah, optimistic. So, you know, you are assuming that you do not have lots of cash misses. Uh, uh, so it's uh, it tends to be optimistic and because in algorithm analysis sometimes we have we count complex operations as one operation you know like uh, uh, complex arithmetic uh, operations like uh, uh, you know s sine and cosine and uh, exponential all of these we, we sometimes we count them as one operation although they uh, you know, they may involve complex algorithms for computing them. Uh, anyway, so if we assume that an, on average uh, an operation takes 10 cycles, then this processor will execute 10 power 9 divided by 10, that's 10 power 8 operations per second. So this is a hundred, a hundred million operations. So now, I if you keep this number in mind, this number is a rough number, you know, not, it's not precise, it's not, it depends on what kinds of operations you are talking about, but it should give you a good indication. So your processor can execute a hundred million in one second. So anything that is less than 100 million operations is going to get executed in a fraction of a second. And when it's a fraction of a second, normally we don't feel it. You know, we, 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 don't, uh, we don't feel that if you, if you run two algorithms, uh, you know, one that takes uh, half a second and one that takes a quarter of a second, you will hardly feel at any difference between, between the two. Uh, so, for an N, for an O of N algorithm, you know, if as long as N is less than this number, 10 power 8, uh, that is considered, you know, fast and you will, the user will not feel a delay. The user of this algorithm will not feel a delay. Now, for an O of N squared, how big should the input be in order for the program to get executed within one second? 10 power 4. So for 10, for O of N, for an O of N algorithm, you know, 10 power 8 can be done in one second. For N squared, 10 power 4 can be done in one second. So with an N squared algorithm, if you do, if the input size is 10 to the power 5, you will feel it. All right, so it will be more than a second. 10 power 5, how many seconds will that be? So 10 over n squared, n equals 10 power 5, how many, how many seconds? Hmm? slightly more than one second. So it's just n squared, right? So it's uh, the time equals 10 power 5 squared divided by 10 power 8. We're assuming that the processor can execute 10 power 8. So 10 power 5 squared divided by 10 uh, power 8, which is 10 power 10 divided by 10 power 8, and that's, uh, that's 100. That's 100 seconds. Okay, so 100 seconds is something that we will feel. So, so the purpose of this is to give you an 
uh, just an, uh, a feel of you know what is fast and what is slow and what we will feel and what we wouldn't feel. Uh, so 10 power 5, if you have an n squared algorithm, you will feel a delay because it's 100 seconds, something that we will definitely feel. But if it's 10 power 5 with, a, with an O of n algorithm, that's going to be you know, 10 power 5 divided by 10 power 8. So this is 10 minus 3 seconds, which is 1 millisecond. One millisecond is something that you will not feel. So this is, you know, this shows the difference between these two algorithms. So what is considered large for n squared is not necessarily large for O of n. Okay. Now it's good to, you know, have a feel of, uh, you know, what is what is big and what is small and what is uh, what we can feel and what we cannot feel and in fact we will be doing an assignment in which you will implement multiple algorithms and uh, uh, you know an n squared algorithm and an n log n algorithm and you do the actual timing so that you can actually feel the uh, the difference in, in, uh, in real time so how many people have done algorithm implementation with timing and measured the difference in actual time between two different algorithms? Okay, only one person. Well, I think this is necessary. You know, you will not appreciate algorithms and you will not, uh, you know, fully appreciate why we learn these algorithms until you actually try two different algorithms uh, a good algorithm and a bad algorithm, and an efficient one and an inefficient algorithm, and see the difference in actual time. You know, see how long the inefficient algorithm will make you wait. So un until you see how long you will have to wait for an inefficient algorithm, you will not appreciate uh, algorithm analysis and design. So th we must do an assignment of this sort. Uh, okay. Yeah, so last time we we made the point that we made the point that uh, the algorithm, the choice of the algorithm is the major factor that affects performance. Because it's the factor that can give you many orders of magnitude of speed up compared to the other factors. What are the other factors that we mentioned last time? Hardware, compiler, programming language, operating system. So all of these other factors, normally they give you a speed up within the same order. They will not give you m multiple orders of magnitude of improvement. Only algorithms can give you this. And it's not only that. You know, sometimes if you don't have an efficient algorithm, the algorithm will not complete within reasonable time. So let's do these calculations for an exponential algorithm. So consider n O of 2 power n algorithm, exponential. So this is an exponential algorithm uh, running on a machine or a processor that can execute 10 power 8 operations per second. Now for n, For n equals 50, you will have the time equals number of operations divided by the speed of the processor. So this is the, the formula that we will be using. So number of operations in this case is going to be 2 power 50. 
and the speed of the processor is 10 power 8. Okay? So now 2 power 50 equals 2 power 20 times 2 power 30 divided by 10 power 8. Remember, you know, 1K equals 2 power 10 and that's approximately 10 power 3. 1 mega is 2 power 20 which is approximately 10 power 6 and this is K and 1 giga is 2 power 30 which is approximately 10 power 9 remember these because we will be using them in our calculations okay so then given these <coughs> 2 power 20 is approximately 10 power 6 and 10 power 30 is approximately 10, 10 power 9 divided by 10 power 8 so this is equal to 15 16. minus 8 that's 10 power 7 10 power 7 what? <coughs> seconds so this is 10 million seconds and this is equal to 10 power 7 divided by you know 3600 that will give you the time in hours and if you further divide it by 24 it will give you the time in days and if you divide it by 365 it will give you the time in years Yeah, so what, uh, what this now, I think it will be 0.37 years, something. Uh, can anyone do this calculation? I believe it's going to be 0.37 years. Uh, okay. So anyway, so this is going to give you a number, it's probably months. So this, this value is is going to be in months. 0.317 years. Hmm? 0.317 years. Oh, oh 0.317. Okay. 0.317 years. Okay, now what if the input size is 100? For n equals 100. So obviously, you know, these, you know, 0.317 years, so this is a third of a year so that's like four months uh, it's not it's not practically acceptable you don't expect your program to take four months to complete it's not uh, it's it's uh, it's too long but what if n equals a hundred what will t be so t in this case will be 2 power 100 divided by 10 power 8 so it's going to be, you know, how much larger will it be? Twice. Twice? Twice. Twice? This is an exponential function. So, so when the input doubles for an exponential function, what will happen to the number of operations? So it will be here, it will be 250 times 250 divided by 10 so it's going to be you know we know this 250 times so this is the answer to the previous one so it will be multiplied by 2 power 50 which is 10 power 15 so this is uh, approximately 10 power 15 times point three one seven years so 10 power 15 is like so 10 power 9 is a billion and 10 power 15 is a million of a billion okay so this is a million of a billion times point three one seven years so it's it's billions of years and it's uh, definitely not the time that we are willing to wait 
for a program to complete. So it's, you know, the point here is that uh, finding an efficient algorithm for solving a problem is not a luxury. It's not just, you know, to speed up the program a little bit. Sometimes, if you don't have an efficient enough algorithm, it's not going to complete within your lifetime. So, if you are trying to run an exponential algorithm with an input size of 100, right, in, uh, then this is not going to complete in your uh, in your lifetime. And the point here is that this is, you know, million, this is a million billion uh, point three years, which means that if you run it on a computer that is a million times faster, it will still be a billion years, right? So if you, you know, the, the supercomputer that they are going to invent a hundred years from today, which is a million times faster than the fastest supercomputer, if it's a, hundred, a million times faster than what we have now, then this will still take a billion years. So the point here is that, you know, the hardware will not help you. You know, faster, a faster processor will not help you if your algorithm requires a huge number of operations to complete. Okay. So this is, you know, these calculations are important to show the, uh, the importance of uh, algorithms. And it's that the algorithm is the, is the major factor. And uh, throwing faster hardware at the problem will not always help. Okay. So any questions on this? Okay, so this is the so basically in conclusion we need you know efficient algorithms uh, otherwise uh, otherwise the computation may not complete within reasonable time. Now do uh, exponential algorithms exist? Yes, Al exponential algorithms do exist, and there are problems for which uh, you know, the best known algorithm is exponential if you want to solve it exactly. Like we said last time, MP complete problems or MP hard problems. Uh, if, if you want an algorithm that solves every instance exactly, that algorithm has to be at least exponential. So how do you think these MP-complete problems are handled in practice? Approximation. Yeah, people use approximate, approximation algorithms. So they use algorithms that are not guaranteed to give you the <laughs> exact solution for every instance. They will give you approximate solution. So they are they're handled by accepting approximations using approximate algorithms <coughs> okay uh, so one just to give you a simple uh, example if you have a, there is a problem called the subset sum problem given a set s and a target set S of integers and a target integer T determine if S has a subset that sums to T exactly. So for example, two, three, four, two, three, four, eight. This is the set. 
So for t equals uh, for t equals seven, the answer is yes. We can find the subset, and this subset is three and four. So yes, the answer is yes. We have three and four. For t equals nine. The answer is yes. We have two, three, and four. Uh, for t equals 11, the answer is yes. We have three and eight. Okay, so how about uh, uh, no, I th oh, it's, uh, well, here it's, so let's look at an example like uh, t equals, so give me a number for which there is no subset, like uh, 15, do we have 15? Negative number? Okay, so 12, yeah, we have 15, uh, 60, well, this is not a, this is not a good example. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, 19, well, if you, you know, if you, any integer that's uh, larger than the sum of these numbers uh, will be, the answer will be no, but that will be a trivial no. So it's, uh, it will be obvious that, uh, What's that? 16. 16. We don't have 16. No, 8 and 4. Yeah, I think 16. We don't have 16. Okay, 16, 12, 14. Yeah, 7, 8. Yeah, I think we don't have 16. So 16 is no. Anyway, so this is not the point. The point is, uh, the point is not figuring out this example. The point is, uh, finding an algorithm that will solve this problem in general. So I give you a set and I give you a target number and your algorithm should print yes or no. Whether there is a subset of that sum or not. So this is the subset sum problem. And this problem looks innocent, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, so this problem is, looks very innocent, looks simple. But in fact, th this is an NP-complete problem. So it's, uh, in, in order to solve this problem, uh, for any given set and for any given target, what's the, what do you have to do? Compare every combination. Yeah, you'll have to find every, s every combination or every subset, consider uh, or check, need to check in general, need to check every combination or subset. But how many combinations do we have? Well, in general, if the size of n for a set of size n, we have how many subsets? Hmm? No, it's not n factorial. N cubed. Hmm? Two. Two power four. Two. No, for n. Yes. Yeah, so two power n. Yeah. So it's two power n. We have two power n subsets, and that's exactly why the algorithm will have to be exponential. So why two power n? Can you have an argument why the, the total number of subsets is two power n? There is a simple argument that, yes? For every additional, for every element you add in, you have the option of saying yes or no. Is it included or excluded? Yeah, exactly. So. A subset will include or exclude an element. So for each element, if you have 
you know, one, two, three, all the way to n, each element has two possibilities. You either take it or not. It's either in the subset or not in the subset. So there are two possibilities for each element with a total of 2 power n possibilities, so 2 power n uh, subsets. So what do we call the set of all subsets of a set? Power set. Yeah, the power set. The power set is the set of all subsets, and the size of the power set is 2 power n. So this is an, uh, an algorithm. This is a problem that looks innocent, but uh, it's an MP-complete problem. And so in order to solve it, so if you write a program that looks at all possible subsets, and if n equals 100, then your program will take billions of years to run. OK? All right, so now let's uh, look more, uh, look at an example that is, look at a familiar, start our algorithm analysis with a familiar example. And the familiar example the familiar example is uh, insertion sort. Uh, let's write it here. So our objective at this point is not to study insertion sort, but to use it as an example to study algorithm analysis, and in particular, uh, the big theta and big omega notations. So let's look at this example for insertion sort. I think five, two, four, six, one. Yeah, I think this should be enough. So this is an example of insertion sort. So what's the idea of insertion sort? So who can describe the idea of insertion sort? Yeah, so what's, yes? We divide it into um, like two sets, and then um, we compare and push the elements. And like, if we divide it into two sets, so divide it in half. Like no, no. Like if we start with five, and mm -hmm. then um, we compare two with five, and then um, two is greater than five. Uh, sorry, smaller than five, so it comes before two, before five, and then we go to the another element like four, and we check for five. Then it will come between two and five. Okay. And then for one, and then we push it before two. So, so where is the insertion? So yeah, the idea is to maintain a sorted subarray. Mm -hmm. So the idea of insertion sort is to say, okay, this is a sorted subarray that has one element in it. So let's, in each step, let's expand it. Let's make it one element bigger. Let's add one element each time. And we will add it in the right place. And how do we add it in the right? So here, 2, we compare 2 with 5. And 5 is larger than 2. So what do we do in this case? Swapping. No, it's not. Uh, in general, it's not going to be swapping. So uh, insertion sort is not based on swapping. It's based on inserting so the element. How do we insert it? What do we do? What do we do with the five? We that. We shift it, right? So we shift the five. So in fact, the way it works is that we are trying to insert two in the right place. So we save the two in some temporary location. So we save two in a temporary location. So it's our key now. And then we compare it with whatever to the left of it. So we have 5. 5 is larger than 2, so we shift it. 
So we'll have 5, 5, 4, 6, 1. So this is one step in the algorithm. So we shifted the 5. Now the 5 overrode the 2, but the 2 we have it stored in a temporary location. Now, after we shift the 5, we get to this point where uh, we have checked all the elements to the left of the, this line, this separator. So now we know that there are no other elements that we need to check. So we always insert the 2 to the right of this pointer. So the 2 is going to be inserted here. 2, 5, 4, 6, 1. So this step, we inserted 2 in place, in, in the right place. And now we have extended the sorted subarray by one so now we started with a sorted array that has two elem one element in it now we have a sorted array that has two elements in it now what will be the next step we will take four and inserting four you now four is the element to be inserted so we put four in a temporary we put it in a temporary because we will be shifting, and that shifting may overwrite the 4. So now this is our pointer. 5, is it larger than 4? Yes. Yes, it's larger than 4, so we shift it. So we shift it, so it's going to overwrite the 4. 2, is it larger than 4? No. no, so we stop. And we insert the 4 to the right of this pointer, where we stopped. Always we insert it to the right of where we stopped. So we stopped at 2, we inserted to the right of 2. Now we have 2. To the right of 2 we have 4. Then we have 5, which got shifted. Then we have 6, then we have 1. And now our sorted subarray is this. So now we have a 3 element sorted subarray. Now next step is inserting 6. Again, we put 6 in a temporary. Now we compare 5 with 6. Is it larger than 6? No. So we stop. So we stop at the first element. And we insert the 6 to the right of the pointer, which means 6 stays where it is. So we put the temporary here. By the way, so now someone may say, okay, 6 is not, 6 uh, is not going to, the position of 6 or the place of for 6 is not going to change. So why would we store it in a temporary and then uh, write the temporary into the 6? Well, this is, if you want to avoid this, you'll have to write code for it. So it's not going to happen automatically. So we'll write the code and we'll see that the code that we will be writing, if you want to just write, uh, you know, s straightforward code, uh, then it's going to save the 6 in a temporary, and then the 6 will override the 6 again. So this is what I meant in the first lecture by, you know, real tracing of an algorithm versus wishful tracing. Okay. So the algorithm will not wishfully here avoid, you know, saving 6 in a temporary unless you write some logic in there that does this. And finally, we insert the 1. So to insert the 1, we compare it with the 6. 6 is larger, so we shift the 6. 5 is larger, so we shift the 6. 5 is larger, we shift the 5. 4 is larger, we shift it. We shift the 2, and we stop here. And again, we insert the 1 to the right of the pointer. So we shift all of these. So now we have 1, 2, 4, 5, 6. OK, so let's write the code.
insertion sort. Of it takes an array and size n. Now we will be writing pseudocode. So in the pseudocode, we will not have, uh, you know, unlike a, a, an actual programming language, we will not have a type. So we'll just put some notes on the side. A is an array of integers. And n is the array size. So we just put some notes. Then, now this algorithm, we start, you know, inserting elements one through four. So what? How? What's the relation between four and the array size? So what's the array size here? So n equals five. So four is n minus one. So we need to go from i equals one to n minus one. So this is the index of the element that we are inserting. Now, how do we insert? What are the steps for inserting an element? Let's look at four. So we scan the elements to its right, right? So, well, first we store it in a temp. So temp equals a of i. Then we go from j equals what? So for 4, when we are inserting 4, i equals 2, we go from j equals what? i minus 1. i minus 1, exactly. The one to the left to it. The one to the left of i. So j equals i minus 1 to, to 0. Now, when do we shift? If what, under what condition do we shift? If a, of j a of j is greater than temp. temp. Yes. Will a of i work? So if we replace temp with a of i here, will it work? Yeah. No, I think it will not work. Why not? You're shifting things around. Yeah, because w after the first shift, yeah. A of I will get overwritten. Yeah. If you have made a w at least one shift, then A of I will get overwritten. So that's exactly why we, we save it in a temp. So if A of J is greater than temp, we shift A of J. So what's the code for shifting A of J? What should I write? Yeah, exactly. So I'm shifting the 5. So from position 1 to position 2. So we're saying position j plus 1 receives a of j. This is the shift. Shift to the right. <coughs> Else What do we do in the else? Nothing. Nothing? So should we go to the next iteration of the loop? J squared J minus one. Well, let's look at this. Here, five is greater than four. Then we got to two, which is uh, two is smaller than four. So we stopped. What does stopping here mean in the code? On the, on the right, we have to insert A of I, the temp. Before that, what do we do? Check, check 2 with 4, J minus minus. So we stop. What does stopping mean? So, if, okay, in general, you are trying to insert this X. And these values are greater than X. There are values greater than X and values smaller than X. So you keep comparing, 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 greater than x, you shift it, shift it, shift it. Now when you get here, this is smaller than x, what do you do? Do you keep going? No. You stop. 
So what does stopping mean here in the code? You break. You break out of the J loop. That's exactly what stopping means. Because the J loop is scanning this, is doing this scan. So you do J from I minus 1 to this value that is smaller than the temp. Right? So when you get to this that is smaller than the temp, you break. Else break. Now, when you break out of the J loop, what do you have to do? To insert the temp, where do you insert it? At what index? J minus 1. J plus 1, exactly. Where to, the, to the right of where your pointer is. So it's your pointer will be at J. So a of j plus 1 equals temp. Receives temp. Now the most interesting observation about this uh, pseudocode is that indentation is significant. So we use indentation. Indentation means something. So here in fact, if you, if you compile this with a C compiler or a Java compiler, will it do what we want it to do? No, why not? Almost works in Python. What's that? Almost works in Python. Almost works in Python. <laughs> <laughs> we are not looking for an almost. OK. So what will happen if we compile this with the C? How will it uh, behave? if we compile it with the C compiler. So the C compiler would think that the, the I loop is this. Right? Because you don't have braces. So it will just, it will think that these are two separate loops. Because you are not doing braces. Uh, the, the C compiler doesn't care about indentation. Doesn't see indentation, just eliminates white space. So it doesn't care about indentation. Indentation is good for, the, for program readability, only for you to read the program. But in our pseudocode, indentation is actually significant. It means something. Uh, and we prefer it to braces. If you want to do braces here, I'm fine with it. So you can do braces uh, you know, if you don't feel comfortable with the indentation. Uh, but you have to be consistent. But you can do indentation as well. Why do we prefer indentation in pseudocode? Readability. Yeah, readability. We don't want it to get messy. You know, if, if we start doing braces and things like that, it, you know, the code will get messier. And in, in pseudocode, we prefer it to be clean and uh, we would like to focus on the algorithm itself. So remember that throughout this semester, indentation matters and indentation told us that this temp is inside the i loop it told us that this j loop is nested in the i loop and that these statements are within the j loop they are not in the i loop and so and this statement is outside the j loop but it's inside the i loop okay now In fact, there is a more compact way of writing this code. Instead of doing the break, we can add this checking. If a of j is greater than temp, we can put it in the loop condition. So we can say, we can write it like this for i equals 1 to n minus 1, temp equals uh, a of i. And for j equals i minus 1 to 0, and you can say and uh, a, of j, a of j plus 1 is, sorry, a of j is greater than temp. Is greater than temp. 
you will just do a of j plus 1 equals a of j. So this is more compact. The asymptotic complexity is the same. And then a of j plus 1 receives 10. OK. So we can analyze either this or that. It doesn't the asymptotic complexity is not going to be different because the difference here is a, between the two is a, is a constant. So let's analyze this because it's more compact. Now when we analyze this code, let's talk about, uh, about best case versus worst case. So best case in algorithm analysis, best case means the lucky case. And what's the lucky case for this algorithm? Yeah, so if the array is already sorted, what will happen here? What will happen to the, so it's like this is sorted, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So when you insert 2, 1 is smaller than 2, th so you'll not be doing any shifting. When you insert 3, you'll not be doing any shifting. When you insert 4, you'll not be doing any shifting. So this means that if the array is sorted, uh, how many times will this be executed? Zero. zero. So this will be executed zero times, which means the inner loop will not be executed. So best case, uh, input array is already sorted. In this case, inner loop will not get executed. What's the running time? The running time is, well, in fact, it's, it's just linear. So we ignore constant. So how many people are, fa are already familiar with uh, theta, big theta? So nobody's familiar with big theta? OK. Uh, so there is big O and big theta and big omega. big omega. So everyone is familiar with big O. So for now, let's just, since everyone is familiar with big O, let's say that the running time for this case is going to be O of n. Mm -hmm. Now I will introduce theta and omega with the worst case. So this is the best case. The best case is easy here. Worst case, what's the worst case? Yeah, it's reversely sorted. So worst case is uh, input array sorted in reverse order. So it's going to be like this. Uh, four, three, two, or sorry, five, five, four, three, two, one. So if it's uh, sorted in the reverse order, we will always be shifting everything. So we, when we insert four, we will shift the five. Then we'll have this, uh, four, five, three. When we insert 3, we will shift 4 and 5. And we will get this. 3, 4, 5. <coughs> when we insert 2, we will shift everything. So if it's reversely sorted, we will be shifting everything. If it's sorted, we will shift nothing. So these are the two extremes, the worst case and the best case. Now in analyzing the worst case, this will be this will be shifted all the time. But in algorithm analysis, we can look at this algorithm and say, okay, let me first compute 
a lower bound on the running time and an upper bound. So a lower bound using the omega notation is a running time that will uh, that the actual running time will be greater than or equal to. And an upper bound is a running time that the actual running time will be less than or equal to. So uh, big O is an upper bound. Of course, we'll say, you know, we will learn more about the big O, the big theta, and big omega in the next lecture. But for now, we're just introducing them. So this is a lower bound. So we can say a lower bound on the running time, running time is n, or is, or is order n, let's say order n, because why is it, why is n a lower bound here? Because the outer loop will get will always get executed anyway right so because the outer loop will will get executed anyway so we know that the running time is not going to be less than n so it's not going to be o of one so order n we express this in asymptotic notation notation using big omega so we say that the running time t of n which is the running time equals omega of n which means that the running time is greater than or equal to omega of n now in terms of uh, an upper bound can we compute an upper bound without calculating the exact running time for this algorithm? Yeah, how can you calculate an upper bound? Hmm? What's an upper bound here? N squared. So it's not going to be any greater than N squared. Why? Because this loop will get executed order N times. And this loop will not be executed more than N times. Because this is the number of shifts. You will never have more than n shifts. In fact, the maximum number of shifts is going to be what? n minus 1. Yeah, you will never have. So the maximum number of shifts is n, and the outer loop is n. So the running time is not going to be any worse than n squared. So that's, we express this, you know, an upper bound. is order n squared and we express this using big O as follows t of n equals O of n squared so in fact the actual use of the big O is not what you have seen before so what w the way you have been using big o is uh, is uh, is not precisely true it's not strictly true because the big o means an upper bound so when you say n squared you are saying that the running time is bounded from above by n squared so it could be n squared or less and by saying that it's bounded from below by n you are saying that it cannot be less than n now if you manage to compute a precise running time then you use the theta so theta is going to be the precise asymptotically precise so if if your if your analysis is precise use theta if you are computing an upper bound or a lower bound, use omega or big O.
Now in this case, for this particular algorithm, who remembers how the precise analysis was done? So how was the precise analysis done? So, so far we haven't done the precise analysis. We only used big O and big omega, which give an upper bound. We could only say that the running time is not going to be less than n. It's not going to be greater than n squared. So it could be anything between n and n squared. It could be one of them. But it could be n log n, for example, so far, based on what we have analyzed so far. So how do we, who remembers how we do the analysis for insertion sort? How do we compute the precise running time? So in this case, what do we need to do in order to analyze it? Count loops. Hmm? Counting loops. How do we count them? So the outer loop will be n times. Okay, the outer loop is executed n times, and the inner loop? No. So will the number of executions of the inner loop always be the same, no. or every time it's different? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the difficulty is that every time it's different. Mm -hmm. So it's not, uh, it's not always the same. So if it had been the same, we would have just counted the number of times the inner loop is executed, and we would have multiplied it by the number of executions of the outer loop, and we would have gotten the exact number of uh, 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 execution times for what is inside the inner loop. You know, it's just like me telling you there is a there are 10 people and each one of them has five dollars how much money do they have in total five times ten right mm -hmm. but if I tell you that there are ten people the first person has a dollar the second person has two dollars the third person has three dollars and the fourth person has four four dollars and so forth how would you calculate the total number the total amount of money that they have in total Multiply yes. Outer to each, uh, sum. Yeah, exactly. It's an arithmetic sum. So you, you have to compute a sum. So when when they all have the same amount of money, you just multiply. But when each one has a different amount of money, you will have to compute a sum. So in this case, in order to compute a sum, we have to come up with a relation, a mathematical relation between i and the number of executions executions of inner loop uh, how much time do we have uh, we, yeah we have a couple more minutes okay and the number of executions of the inner loop so when i equals one in the worst case how many shifts we do so five four three two one. We do one shift. One now, when I equals, sorry, yeah, when I equals one, we do one shift. When I equals two, two. we do two shifts. What's the maximum value of I? N minus one. When I equals N minus one, you know, in the last step, when we insert the one, we do N minus one shift. So the number of shifts is equal to i, in fact. So total number of executions or shifts equals 1 plus 2 plus n minus 1. And what is this equal to? What kind of series is this? This is an arithmetic series. And the sum of this is what? N times N minus 1 divided by 2. N minus 1 times N divided by 2. And this is asymptotically. What's this asymptotically? N squared. N squared. Yeah. So in this case, we say it's theta of N squared. So. Yeah, we will learn more about theta and omega and big O, but let me just emphasize the point that in order to use theta, you have to do a